Good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes. Now, are there some of you that hear me too loudly? We need to, you know, play with our volume adjustments because some of you really need to hear me, and there are others who say, don't need to hear you that much. So, that's kind of how it works. Well, a welcome to all of you this morning. This is a very special day. We have with us the Reverend Dr. Jean Simpson from the Florida Conference, and I'm going to give her an opportunity to give us greetings here <clears throat> in just a moment. Very special welcome to all of our guests who are here this morning. No matter who you are or where you are, you are welcome here at the Northport Community United Church of Christ. Do we have any first-time visitors who are with us this morning? If so, would you raise your hand because we have something we would like to give to you. Right down here, we have a hand up. Differently. 
than you've heard it before. There is a resource book that goes with this that's pretty important for each participant to have access to, and that book sells for $17. So if you are planning to attend, let Patty know, get that word into the church office so that we can get books ordered in advance so that you will have it when you start the first session. Uh, that Bible study, as I said, will begin the Thursday after Ash Wednesday. Um, it's the date of Ash Wednesday. It's coming up this month. It's, when is it? 22nd. All right, thank you. So this will be then the 23rd at 1.30. The, these will meet at 1.30 in the afternoon in this adjoining room. And lastly, but probably most important, we are going to be receiving new members on the last Sunday of this month on the 26th. So if you would like to become a member either an associate or a full member of this church, please, again, let us know because there is a membership application to be filled out so that we can get information about you and know in advance that you're coming in to membership. Are there any other announcements? Norma, of course. <laughs>
Gene Simpson has been very important to this church, uh, especially in the recent past of the church. And uh, Gene has come back today to celebrate with us that we seem to have been, we're on the rebound. And so uh, she is here, and I'm going to ask her to bring greetings from the conference. Good morning, church. <coughs> it's good to be back with you, and also with my colleague, Joe Lou. Um, we go back, way back, because he plays trumpet, and I play more, but I won't hold the trumpet against him. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to give you greetings from the Florida Conference. We have many things going on at this time. We just did a long-term care uh, seminar up in Sarasota for all our churches. We have uh, disaster planning for all our churches coming up uh, real soon and in Sarasota, the main uh, area from Pensacola to Mark Island is my region. So we try to do it in the middle um, of, this, of my region. And so that's very, very important coming up. We have our annual meeting, which we held this year at Bureau Beach in the first weekend of May. So please look at our website, um, uccfla.org. Under upcoming events, there's still so much going on. I'd like to keep you informed about church by town things and about um, all kinds of planning ahead for our churches here in Florida. It is a blessing. I won't take any more of your time, but I will be here after worship uh, to greet and give you the blessings. Thank you. Let us be in worship.
sometimes it is important to remain still before moving ahead, to assess the present before embarking upon the future, to regain one's balance, perspective, and center. We come together for worship to become focused and centered, to hear God's voice, to feel God's presence with us. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Let us join in singing our opening hymn number 17 for worship.
gospel reading this morning is from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verse 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions, and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame became, began to spread throughout the whole surrounding region of Galilee. <laughs> like to have the children come and join me up here in the front, please. Any children here this morning? They're not here. Well, then you're all children. Sorry about that. But Jane and I worked real hard for hours and hours and hours and hours <coughs> on a presentation for you this morning. We did? <laughs> It's really good being with you, but you know, that instrument looks a little bit different than mine. Yours is yeah. silver and mine's brass and mine's over a hundred years old and yours looks a little newer. Um, and yours has got bunches of stuff. Yeah, about 15, 15 all around, times all of over the place. And mine's rather sleek and slim. <laughs> you know, looks this like, like a plumber's paradise. Compared to yours. Plumber's paradise, right here. <laughs> but you know something? Um, we play in many different groups together. And one of the best places we can play is in an orchestra where you have strings and woodwinds and brass and percussion. And there's high instruments, medium orchestras, and there's low instruments. But you play along with the strings, the violins, and the flutes. And I play along with the cellos and clarinets and bassoons. You know, and we all get along. Um, if we follow one person, mm -hmm. which is the... Uh, that would be the orchestra leader. Right. And... We call the conductor. Conductor. Yes. But anyway, if we did it, we just go, we just play on the thing, right? <laughs> But mine sounded better than yours. <laughs> <laughs> I never argue with my bastards. <laughs> They're the boss. Anyway, but if we maybe join together, we might be able to do something together. Hmm. Should we try that? Sure, why not? Okay. <laughs>
the thanks be of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gene. <coughs> that was fun. <coughs> this is our time for celebrations <coughs> and concerns, and we begin with our celebrations. Are there things that you would like to celebrate today? We'll go back there. An early celebration of a Patriots win. <laughs>
sister and, uh, and your daughter. Okay. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Our gracious God, we come together here this morning as your people under the authority of Jesus Christ who is the one that we follow. And we come because we know that we have been blessed by you with so many gifts and the gift of life. And that Jesus comes offering us the fullness of life and how we may live with one another in love and care and in fellowship. <coughs> Thank you for all of the expressions of gratitude and thankfulness that have been lifted up here this morning. People celebrating their wedding anniversaries, recovering from illnesses, people who have come through difficult times successfully. We turn our thoughts to those who are suffering the loss of loved ones, people who have been important and valued in this church. We lift up to you in prayer people who are struggling with illness, especially cancer that we heard about this morning, but people who are experiencing other physical difficulties, with heart, back. And we pray that all your healing may be with them, that they may know wholeness and wellness. And now, God, we turn to you in the silent prayers that we each bring with our lives and our hearts. These are prayers we offer to you in the name of Jesus Christ, whom we follow. Let us now express our gratitude with the giving of our gifts. <laughs>
We remember your wondrous works and gifts to us on our behalf, O oh God. In response, we open our lives and bring these our offerings. May they reflect our gratitude and work miracles for your commonwealth in Christ's name. is from Paul's first letter to the church at Carmel, chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who no claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. But anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, who through, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now that they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound your conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. <coughs> gathering to which people were invited. When they arrived at the designated place, they were greeted by two separate tables, each with chairs around them, each with a large sign on the table. One sign said we, and the other sign said they. The people entered the room but no one sat down at either of the two tables because no one knew if she or he was a we or a they. Each one looked quickly at the others, trying to get some signal of which side he or she was on. None came, so all remained standing, walking around nervously, wondering what to do. After a while, one of the people took the signs from the tables, moved the tables together, and sat down. The others also sat down, all together, around one enlarged table. And one of the people then turned one of the signs over and wrote, All, and placed it. There was a gathering to which people 
were invited, when they arrived at the designated place, two separate tables, each with chairs around them, each with a large sign on the table. One sign said we, and the other said they. Each one looked quickly at the others, trying to get some signal of which side she or he was on. None came, so all remained standing, walking around nervously, wondering what to do. After a while, one of the people took the signs from the table, moved the tables together, and sat down. The others sat down, all together, around one enlarged table. One of the people then turned one of the signs over and wrote all and placed it on the table. All were together around one table. The epistle reading we just heard read speaks clearly, it seems to me, about God's intentions for all of God's people to be included and inclusive, as though all live in one world with one common creator. Thus, the sermon this morning should be fairly easy because it concerns something with which we are all very comfortable, our oneness and equality as God's people. For whom among us would dare think that there are any real differences that would designate some of us as different, that is, superior than any others. Who among us would be so arrogant or disrespectful to our basic Christian, as well as American, values to see differences as a worthy way of making distinctions that would make us separate ourselves as being better than others. Well, to be honest, I would for one. Even though, on the one hand, I am perfectly clear, as I am sure you are, about what Christ expects of me in my attitudes towards others, regardless of who they are, I'm also aware of what I call my shadowy side. There lurks within me real fears and prejudices about others, many of them, who think and believe differently or look and act differently than I do. So this morning for these few moments, I want to address both of these aspects honestly, as I and hopefully you <coughs> seek to be transformed by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. On the positive side, I think that some things are very clear to us as Christians. It is clear to me, when I am thinking as a Christian, that we are to hold all people, which means each other, in mutual esteem and love, regardless of who we each are. It is clear to me that God wills for the unity of all people, not conformity, but unity. The nature of God is unity, and this is the one God for all people. The God of the Hebrews put an end to tribal, and national gods of other peoples. So says the reading of Deuteronomy. Our God is the only God whom we are all to love fully. And then Jesus said that a second commandment that is equally important is to love our neighbor as ourselves and to love one another as he loves us. And when Jesus prayed for his disciples, and it is, as is written in the 17th chapter of John, which has become the motto of the United Church of Christ, 
he prayed that they might all be one in unity with God, just as he and God are in unity. God's nature is the unifying force of all people. Through God, the walls and barriers of separation are destroyed, and the walls of nationalism, denominationalism, ageism, sexism, racism, or culturalism. On this, the fight is very clear. Anything less than being in unity, all about one table, is a corruption of God's will. It is clear to me, through the conscience and leadership of the church, that we have made great strides in our nation and in our world in our attitudes and behaviors concerning race, gender, lifestyles, and culture. Racial slurs and derogatory names of all sorts are not as often heard and not very well tolerated as they were when I was a child. We are now used to seeing people of a variety of races, both women and men, and from varying cultures in positions of leadership and responsible positions. In short, it is clear to me, as it is for you, where the church stands on this issue of inclusivity. It is clear that we are to be together as one people. In my best moments, this is clear. And I strongly support it. I am for the unity of all God's people. We are all together. But what is equally clear to me is that there is a shadowy side of my existence this. The people of God do not yet dwell in unity for me. When Jesus prayed, he also prayed that his disciples should be protected from the power and the force of the evil one, the devil, who works his insidious ways into me and affects my lingering doubts and attitudes. I still notice people who are different, who look different, I notice it because I am doubtful and fearful and suspicious of who they are and what they might be up to. I see in them that they are not we and they are different in ways I don't appreciate. Until I get to know one, each one individually, I hear my internal early warning system saying, be careful. And what's equally important to know is that I hear these people have early warning systems of their own that say the same thing to them about me. So the we, they division is maintained. I'm aware that I am a prejudiced person when it comes to people who don't look quite the way I think they should. I'm still trying to get used to people who cover their bodies with an abundance of tattoos. And then there are the people who believe and think very differently than I do. I have trouble with closed-minded fundamentalists, for instance. I'm one of those people who can honestly say, I think we should love and accept all people, and I hate those who don't. <laughs> I'm not proud of this confession. It reflects my shadowy side. It helps me be aware that I need the transforming power of God's grace that comes to me. The call and promise of the gospel is not for acceptance and complacency about my 
shadowy side, but for unity. Unity within myself and the unity of God's people working together on a common problem. The liberating gospel that calls us is a gospel that invites Christians to reach across all chasms of separation. We are invited to find ways of expressing our unity with others as one community of God's people. To dwell in unity as brothers and sisters is the will of God. We know that as Christ's followers, we are to work for the kingdom of God on earth. So we must work to put the tables together, to take down the signs saying we and they, and erect the sign that says all. Now, in this season we are approaching a Valentine's of hearts. We are reminded that love is the way to the kingdom. But for Christians, it is not the love of sentimental hearts and flowers, but the love of Christ that lowers all barriers of separation. Paul tells us in the epistle lesson this morning that we are to come together as one people, not separated by religious customs, rituals, or culture. When we do set ourselves apart, we sin against the will of God as set forth in Christ. come to the table for communion this morning, let it be as a symbol of unity that all gather together about Christ's table as one people, the people of God, for whom grace is given. There are no barriers to this table, as there are no walls to God's love. Then, may we go forth into the world, into our daily lives, working to bring the tables of all people together, seeing ourselves as part of one people here on God's earth. Let us. Gracious God, we are so thankful for your unifying love. We confess that there are many times and ways in which we resist Help us to overcome this resistance, to receive the fullness of your love for us and for all people, that we may indeed be the carriers of unity in all that we do. We pray this in the name of Christ, who invites us now to gather about this table, which he has set before us. Amen. Let us join singing. Our communion hymn, number 223, as we gather at the table. <laughs>
of the Lord that is set for us, it is important that we realize that we are all guests here, that Jesus Christ is the host and invites us to come no matter who we are or where we are in terms of our faith and our understandings, for there is nothing that separates us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. This indeed is the table for all of us in God's people. In this church, we receive of the bread as soon as it is passed to us, symbolizing that we do come as individuals and that we each have our own interpretations, understandings, and personal relationships with Jesus Christ. And we wait until all have received of the cup and take it together, then symbolizing that even though we are all individuals, we do come together as one in the body of Christ and express our unity in the taking of the cup. Come, for the with you. I invite you into prayer. Creating Holy God, you give us the breath that we take in, the breath that we take out. You are continuously present with us at all times. Help us to keep in remembrance of you. You that care and love and give us the grace of our life through Jesus Christ. Guide us now, God. Guide us in our own meditation the oneness with you, the oneness with our church. Amen. As scripture informs us, it was during Passover that Jesus was with his friends in an upper room. And probably at the end of the room was Elijah's bread and cup, for they were always waiting for Elijah. And Jesus took this bread at that point and gave thanks to his father, and then broke it and gave it to his friends around the table and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat all of this. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after that supper, he took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he said to the disciples, this is the cup of the new cup. It is my blood shed for you and poured out for many. Drink this in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in his name, we give you this bread and this cup. Come for everything.
partake and drink, for this is Christ's blood.